All right, and we'll go ahead and get started here. Let's go to Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. Good old Job. All right, one person told me one time, the book of Job. <laughs> Maybe he figured he needed a job. He was going to go look in the book of Job. No, it is Job. Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was actually written before the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. And uh, it chronicles the story of Job who had a covenant with God personally, directly, individually, before the Abrahamic covenant, obviously before the New Covenant. Uh, so it talks about his story. And there's a lot of information in there. The big thing you got to remember about Job is, is that God knew Job what happened to Job. It was the devil. Okay. And uh, once you understand that, it all kind of falls into place. You know, and, and this is something that I'm amazed about Christians anyway. I'm not talking about us. We know better. But Christians out there, I talked to a guy at work. I was telling blood on the way in today. I talked to a guy at work, and he was raised Baptist, just like I was raised Baptist, you know. And he grew up in church, and he goes to church, you know, quasi-regularly. You know, not too regularly, but quasi-regularly. And he and I were talking about uh, issues concerning death and, you know, uh, that when you die, your absent body, you're present with the Lord. He was like, yes, amen, that's right. And then I said, and then, of course, one day you're buried, and, and you're in the ground, but your body will be raised up and going to be with the Lord, you know. And, and you will have a new body, and he looked at me like, what? And I said, yeah, you know, your body will be raised. He said, well, what about all the people that are in the ocean that got eaten by sharks? I said, what about them? He said, you telling me that all their body parts are going to come back together? I said, dude, we're talking about God. I mean, this is the guy that, that split the Red Sea, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, but what about the people that are cremated? I said, have you ever seen Star Trek? You know, they they take them apart, they put them back together. I mean, if man can conceive of that, then why would you think God could take all those parts and put them back together supernaturally? He looked at me like, you are out of your mind. He said, you believe some very strange things. And I thought, you know, the Bible teaches this. Well, why don't you understand this? But, see, that is the state, unfortunately, that a lot of Christians are in these days, is they don't read the Bible, they don't study the Bible, and they don't understand what it says. And it's it's written, you know what, it's written in English. <laughs> it may be King James English in some Bibles, you know, that you may have to kind of figure out the withers and feathers and all that, but it's still English, and you can figure it out. And besides, we got the Holy Ghost, the teacher of the church. Praise the Lord. He can reveal to us supernaturally what we need to know. But anyway, I was just amazed. And I was headed somewhere with that. Let's see. <laughs> I was talking about the fact that we were, we were talking about uh, supernatural things, spiritual things. And, um, oh, Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And people get confused about Job. I knew it'd come to People get confused about Job because they think God did it to him. Well, no, the devil did it to him. And then he got back everything that he lost plus more. So he ended up okay. You know, don't worry about Job. He ended up fine. So, praise the Lord. There, there's a lot of information in the book of Job. This particular verse of Scripture, 32 verse 8, says, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him under, giveth them understanding. Now, as usual, I like to take it apart in, in the Hebrew or the Greek or the original language, in this case Hebrew, and find out what it's really saying to us. There is a spirit in man. The word spirit here is rosh in the Hebrew, which is kind of hard to say, but I'm not going to go try it again. I'll leave it alone. But it means wind or breath. Now, the wind or the breath is really, you remember when uh, the, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that God breathed the breath of life into Adam? And I like what Brother Kenneth Copeland, the way he describes it, he says, if you know, Think of it this way. God created this body out of the dust of the earth, and he had a body there, and that body was just a chunk of flesh. You know, kind of look at it as, as kind of a big mannequin-looking thing. He picks it up, and since it was a, an exact duplication of him physically, because, you know, it was made in his image after his likeness, 
And if you look at the Hebrew, it means almost like a Xerox copy. I mean, he was the same height and all those good things. So he picked him up by the shoulders, held him up, and breathed mouth to mouth, breathed into him the breath of life. And when he breathed into him the breath of life, he became a living soul, it says. All right, so in other words, that breath is what gave that chunk of meat life. All right, it says there's a spirit in man. The word spirit there is wind or breath. So the very meaning of the spirit is wind or breath. Now, here's what's interesting. And the inspiration, the word inspiration is neshama in the Hebrew. It means a puff of wind. Isn't that good? A puff of wind, which is also translated divine inspiration or the intellect. Divine inspiration or the intellect. In other words, when you think, you know, you're sitting here today, you may be thinking about lunch. I don't know. You know, hopefully you're thinking about the Word of God. <laughs> but at any rate, you, whatever you're thinking about, whatever's going on in your mind, you understand that you are thinking. It's your thoughts. Well, that thought process is occurring as intellect or as an area of the spirit. Now, you are a spirit. You have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. You live in a physical body. We know that from previous studies we've done. Well, there it's, and we also know this, that the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, says it is very hard to distinguish or separate the difference between the soul and the spirit. However, it can be done because it says the only thing that can do that is the word of God. And the reason that I think he puts it that way is you have to study the Word of God to know what is spirit and what is mind. What is spirit and what is soul. Now, see, we say soul, but when we say soul, we don't often realize there's three aspects to soul. Soul itself is a triune thing, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions. If you understand, this, this is one to chew on. Take this from home, chew on it. If you understand that your mind, your will, and your emotions within your soul are different aspects, different things, that'll help you. See, your emotion, where you cry, and you, oh, you grieve, and you're upset, that's emotion. That's happening in your soul. That's not happening in your spirit. Your spirit is looking at you going, what in the world's wrong with you, boy? I don't understand this. Because your spirit doesn't, that's not the emotional part of you. Now, the part of you that gets, you know, <laughs> I order stuff from the Internet, and I get boxes in the mail, and I open those boxes up and go, look at this cool thing. You know, it's usually some technical technology thing, you know. And I'll open it up, and and this is not unique with just me. It's, it's I think it's unique to all geeks, maybe. I don't know. But geeks like opening these boxes up so much, they have whole video shows on the Internet, on YouTube, about the unboxing. Well, I'm going to unbox my phone. I'm going to unbox my tablet. And they'll show people, look at this, I'm unboxing it. You know, why? Because they're excited about their new toy. Well, that's okay. But where's that excitement happening? In the, in, not the spirit, but in the soul. That's the emotions. You get excited because you're emotional about, woo, this is so fun. You know, that when you get excited at Christmas and open a present, that's because of emotion. Now, you know, I've opened presents at Christmas when I was a kid, and it was socks. <laughs> and I opened it up and went, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I need those. I'm not excited about socks. Matter of fact, I came to the realization, this was a revelation for me, maybe it would be a revelation for you, I don't know, but I came to the revelation that black goes with everything. And so I only buy black socks, and actually I don't even buy them, Belinda buys them, I don't buy them. But all of my socks are exactly the same color and exactly the same style, and that way I don't have to figure out which ones go together. They all go together. You say, well, that's boring, Dr. Bill. Look, it's a sock. It doesn't beat, it doesn't flash, and it doesn't take batteries. Why in the world would I ever care? Know what I'm saying? So socks just don't do it for me. You know, maybe you get excited about socks. Maybe you have lots of weird socks. I don't know. But see, my whole sock revelation helped me so much to understand 
that they just keep my feet warm. That's what they're for, you know. Some people say, well, my phone is just to make phone calls. Well, then you don't have a cool phone. You need a cool phone. That's why they call them smartphones, because they do fun things. I got to play with mine this week. I've had this thing for two years. I hadn't done the GPS part yet. And so I got, I was looking for a particular location, and I pushed some buttons, and it said, turn right at the next intersection. And I'm like, my phone is telling me where to go. This is cool, you know. Now, you might say, well, yeah, I've done that all the time. But I didn't really think about it until I was kind of stuck and thought, Am I at the right place? Oh, I know. So I punched it in. I went to the browser. I found the location of where I was supposed to be. I hit the button. I told it to use the GPS, and it starts telling me where to go. Turns out I had left where I was supposed to be, driven off, and had to turn around and go back where I was. I was in the right place. But it was fun, <laughs> you know, because I got to play with my phone. I should have just stayed where I was. I'd have been, I'd have, it was fine. But anyway, so, but I got there, and, and I got to go to the meeting I was going to and, and got to see Batman, so hallelujah. It was one of those things where they, they talk to you about work stuff and then they say, oh, by the way, we're going to show you this movie and it was that bad. So, I had fun. So anyway, and it, it was free too. See, that was the cool thing. So I had fun with my phone and I had fun with my electronics, but all of that's emotion. All that has to do with just emotional area. Well, you are a spirit being, first of all, that spirit being has a spiritual body that you can't see, but he's in here. Now, this physical flesh is just a shell. It's just a, an earth suit. It's a house. And the Bible actually calls it a tent. A tent represents a, a temporary dwelling. You don't normally live in a tent. You set up a tent, you camp, you take it down. Well, that's exactly the way our physical body is. It's a tent. We set it up when we're born. We live in it a while, a very brief while, and then we take it down. Well, now, let me ask you this, and this is part of what Keith Moore was saying this morning. He said when you, when you take your tent down, do you cease to exist? No, you just go somewhere else and live in a, a home or a house or whatever. When you're using the tent, you're just in the tent. When you take it down, it's not a tragic, terrible thing. You just took your tent down, and you went to another location. He, he gave the example, and I like this, he gave the example of, uh, he said, I preached Friday night. I was wearing a different suit then. I had to take that suit off and put this suit on. Now I'm in this suit. And he held his suit. He said, that was not a tragic thing. I just changed clothes. Do you get upset when you change clothes? No. And so that was his point. You know, all we're doing is changing clothes. We're going to put on a, a heavenly body. You know, this earthly body, okay, that's fine, but we got the heavenly body to look forward to. Well, same kind of thing. We're in this physical body, but it's just a, it's a dwelling place. Then we are a spirit, we live in that body, but we have, meaning we possess, meaning it's our possession, a mind that we think with, that's the intellect, will, which we make decisions with, and emotions, which we emote with. We have fun, or we get sad, or whatever. All of those emotions are just a part of the soulish realm. Now, remember that I said this. We have a soul. We are not a soul. We have one. We are a spirit. See, and that's the difference between spirit and soul that a lot of people miss. First of all, you have to realize you are a spirit. You have a soul. Now, the reason I like to put it that way is very simple, because a lot of people think they are what they're thinking. You are not what you're thinking. What you're thinking is what your possession is doing. Take a computer, and I'll use my phone as an example because it's a computer, believe me. But uh, this is a more powerful computer than what they sent people to the moon with back in the 60s. I mean, can you imagine that? That's just amazing. But anyway, it's a computer. This thing can do all kinds of calculations. But there's nothing really unique about this in terms of, 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 of it's me. This is me. No, it's not me. This is my phone. If I were to put it down and buy another phone, that would be my phone. 
There's nothing to tie me to this phone other than it's just my possession, is my point. See what I'm saying? Same thing with your soulish realm. That's why people shouldn't let their emotions drive them. You shouldn't let your um, intellect drive you. You see what I'm saying? There are a lot of people, and, and, and you gotta, kind of got to be careful here the way you say this, but it's true. There are a lot of people that are so intellect-driven, they refuse to believe in spiritual things because I'm too smart for that. Well, that's dumb. I'm sorry. You think you're being so smart, but what you're doing is you're denying the real you. You are a spirit. Your spirit is spiritual. Okay? That's the real thing. The mind and the will and the emotions, that's just your possession. That's just, that's just a phone. You use it. You deal with it. You operate with it. You think with it. You calculate with it. Now, personally, my math processor is not as good as other people's math processors. I'm talking about me. You know, 2 plus 2, I've got. Okay, that's 4. But if I go much beyond that, I have to pull up a calculator because my math coprocessor is just not as enhanced as other folks' math coprocessors. Now, that doesn't mean that my computer is bad. I have a phenomenal ability to remember and deal with technological facts to the point that I can run computers and people go, what in the world? How do you know that? How can you possibly remember all that? Well, you know, my computer has the ability to retain all that information, my intellect. That's fine. That's just my gift, you might say. But the math coprocessor is not one of those things. <laughs> okay? So you see what I'm saying? A lot of you going, I'm not sure. You know, uh, it's all computer stuff. Well, hey, I talk computers. But most of us have enough relationship with a computer that we can kind of understand these things. But the thing is, this is a tool. Your mind is a tool. Don't be driven by your mind. Don't be driven by your emotions. Be driven by your spirit. That's the key. Now, said all that to say this. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. The word understanding is fascinating to me, and that is the Hebrew word bene, from which we get the word benediction. I always wondered where that word benediction came from. Well, bene is the root of that. Understanding, to separate mentally, to distinguish, or to understand. In other words, to separate mentally, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example for this. When you deal with certain things, you have to categorize them. You have to put them in certain boxes, mentally, if you will. To separate mentally means I can sort through what's important, what's not important, what I need to deal with now, what I can put off till later. You see what I'm saying? Prioritizing. Okay? to distinguish, so how do I deal with certain things? How do I, what do I do with this? And then to understand, well, that means a depth of comprehension and understanding. So we take all of that, we put it back into the verse. There is a spirit man, you are a spirit. The inspiration of God, the Almighty, gives us understanding, the ability to distinguish, and the ability to separate mentally. Now, I said all that again to say this, and that is, there's a lot of people that have problems distinguishing the truth, understanding things, and separating things and prioritizing things. And the reason is, they don't have any inspiration from the Almighty. They don't have any puff of wind. See, just because God breathed life in you one time doesn't mean he's through. Selah. <laughs> Amen. Just because he breathed the breath of life into you doesn't mean he's through puffing. Okay? It's a puff of wind. It's divine inspiration. It is what gives you insights. We call it revelation knowledge. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Matter of fact, I hadn't given you the title yet, and I always like to do that. The title for this today is God Has a Destiny for You. God 
God has a destiny for you. And you say, well, Dr. Bell, how, how you get there from here? <laughs> we'll get there. Let's go to uh, Zechariah 12.1. The burden of the word of the Lord of Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. It says God forms the spirit of man within him. Now, what's interesting about that is this. The Hebrew word for um, formeth is yaltzar, meaning squeezing into shape to mold into a form as a potter. Now, see, get a mental image of that. A potter shaping clay, that process. A potter can take a lump of clay that has no form to it whatsoever, throw it on the wheel, plop, spin that wheel, and start using his fingers to mold, and that thing will turn into a beautiful pot. And I have done some you know, pottery like that, and it is, first of all, it's harder than it looks. <laughs> but once you get it down where you're working with it, it's amazing to feel that sensation of that clay conforming to your decisions of how you want that pot to look. And you shape that pot the way you want it to look. You as the potter are in charge of making sure the shape comes out the way you want it. And if it doesn't, you squish it back together, you start over, and you, you make the pot look like you want it. That's the whole purpose. Well, that's what it's saying here is, the Lord formeth the spirit of a man within him. Now, part of the meaning of this, part of the meaning of this potter is to determine. That's the purpose. The reason the potter makes the pot the way he makes it is it is a determined plan. Now, this is what I want us to see about God and our spirit. Remember, you are a spirit. You have a mind, will, and emotion. You live in this, this earth suit, but you are a spirit. The real you was formed by God. The real you was shaped by God and given a determined shape. We look at it this way. He gave you a destiny. He gave you a determined shape for your life. See, and I believe this. I, I believe in destiny. Now, not weird, okay? You know, like, no matter what you do, you're going to either be born again or not. You know, I'm not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about for your life, there's a plan. And if you hook into the plan, you'll be much happier than if you didn't hook into the plan. Now, if you have a destiny and God is shaping you in that direction, and you rebel against that and turn from that, you're not going to have a lot of fun in life. Okay? But you are a free moral agent, and you can make decisions, and if you don't receive Jesus as your Lord, you really won't have a lot of fun, either in this life or the next, especially in the next. I'm telling you, it won't be fun. Well, if you get in line with the potter, and let him shape you and say, okay, Lord, this is my direction, this is my destiny, this is what you want for me, I'm good with that. And you go with that, I tell you, it gets fun. And it's fulfilling. And it's wonderful. So you need to find out what your what your plan from the Lord is. Better, better put it that way. The Lord's plan for you. Get in line with that. And... It'll be exciting. It'll be a blessing. And a lot of people say, yeah, but Dr. Bill loves me. wants me to go to Africa. Then when you get to Africa, you will have the time of your life. But I don't want to go to Africa. Well, it's, it's very likely then he doesn't want you to go to Africa. Don't sweat it. He's got something good for you. Most likely it is doing the things that you enjoy doing. Because that's the way he made you. You know? People get all bent out of shape. What if God? Well, what if he didn't? What if he just wants you to do what you're called to do and you, what you are called to do is a good thing and you're, you're fine with it? See, God has plans for us and they're good. Amen. All right. Um, so, we talked about the word formant. The spirit of man, of course, spirit is that same word, breath or wind. 
within him. Within him is huh, kere in the Hebrew, close enough. It's actually transliterated Q-U-R-E-V, but it's pronounced kere. Go figure out that out. But at any rate, it means the nearest part or the center. So in other words, this goes back to telling us what we already know from our previous studies about spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit, and the spirit is the heart of man. Not heart like the blood pump, but heart is in the core or the center, like the heart of a tree or the heart of a matter. Let's get to the heart of the matter. That means get to the core, get to the center. So he says that he forms the breath or wind within us in the center. So he, he shapes our human spirit into what he wants it to be in terms of destiny. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. It says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Do you know God has wisdom? Amen. And it says even the hidden wisdom. That means he's got some wisdom that he's hiding. Well, Dr. Bill, is that fair that God would hide it? Well, he's hiding it from the devil. See, if the devil knew everything that God knew, first of all, Poor boy would be in really bad shape. <laughs> He'd know his end. <laughs> anyway, I'll not go there. But it says, Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world under our glory, for uh, none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's the, really the point. If the devil had known what Jesus' plan was, he would have never crucified him. Because that was the plan. That was the plan of redemption. So there were hidden, secretive things that God was keeping from the devil. And see, he, the devil is not all omniscient. God's the one that's omniscient. People are confusing the devil with God all the time. They make the devil out to be all-powerful, and they make him out to be omniscient, and God, bless his heart, he doesn't know and understand about computers and things, because after all, he's God, he's old, you know. Folks, come on. I mean, where in the world do people come up with stuff like that? And yet I've talked to people, you really think God understands computers? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Think about what you're saying. You know, I mean, everything I learned about computers, I, I learned because I committed myself that the life of God was within me and I was going to learn and retain things. So I believe he taught me a great deal about computers. I happen to know in a few instances he revealed supernaturally to me how to fix things that I didn't know how to fix in computers. You think God really understands computers? Well, he did when he talked to me. <laughs> and if you work on engines, he understands engines. Matter of fact, he understands it all because he's God. See, is that kind of the point? He's God. <laughs> now, the cool thing is, this wisdom that he has is for us. See, it's not for the devil. He's keeping it from the devil. If the princes of this world, if the spiritual forces that were around uh, when Jesus was going to the cross. If they did not, they wouldn't crucify the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. Remember the heart. That's the core. That's the center. That's the spirit. We're not talking about the mind, the heart. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. That's me. I love him. So it's prepared for me and you. All right. Um, verse 10. But God. I like the but there. But God. See, we're talking about hidden wisdom. But. God hid it. But. But God. Half. Half. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but half is past tense. That means it's already an accomplished fact. This is not something God's going to to do, it's something he hath already done. <laughs> Putting it in King James. Alright? He hath already done this. He's revealed them unto us how? By his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Oh, Brother Bill, I want to get into the deep things of God. Well, he's already revealed them. They're in his word. They're available to us. You know, now they're not available to the devil. And I'll tell you one thing, it's not good for you to reveal a whole lot of stuff to the devil. Get the microphone. <laughs> because the boy doesn't know what's going on. He's, he's lost, he's confused. He 
doesn't have power that everybody thinks he has. So don't reveal what's going on in your life to him. Don't sit around and rehash, oh, the devil's pushing me around and he's doing this, doing that. And he's sitting there taking notes going, oh, really, that's working. Okay, I'll remember that. We'll step that part up. And say, don't reveal it to him. Keep your mouth shut. That's all you got to do. Or, hmm, that was a little too abrupt. Let's, let's say what Jerry Spell says. Use the vocabulary of silence. That, that sounds much more intellectual, intelligent, you know. The vocabulary of silence is you don't have to say anything. You, you are not obligated to reveal all you know. You're not obligated to talk about everything going on in your life. Now, I know a lot of you like getting around each other and, and what's happening in your life? Oh, what's happening? Oh, it's rough, man. I'm, and I can't pay my bills. No, no, no. Well, why reveal all that? When people say, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. Well, good. Well, I hadn't revealed any great details in my life other than that I'm blessed and highly favored. Now, if, if there's something I need to share with you, I'll share with you. That's not a problem. But I'm just saying there's no reason to rehash everything, particularly negative things. I am really disturbed. And I was talking about this coming uh, to the church this morning, too about all the contemporary Christian music today, all they want to talk about is, woe is us. Everybody's got problems, particularly young people. You know, we don't know what to do. We're lost, we're dying, and we're going to hell. And that's what they want to sing about. Why not sing, Jesus paid it all? All to him I owe. <laughs> you know, that's an old hymn. But it's got a whole lot more wisdom than a lot of these songs that, that you know, younger folks are singing. Now that I got a little gray in my beard, I can say the younger folks are singing. You know, it used to be I was the one listening to the, <laughs> the stuff. But and I like contemporary Christian music, but I don't like a lot of what I'm hearing today. You know, uh, I was playing a Petra song coming into work. You know, stand up, take a stand for Jesus, and I'm going, yeah. Why don't they play music like that anymore? Oh, that's so 80s, Doctor Bill. Well, hey, it's scriptural. You know, I was telling Ben, we were talking about Pandora. I don't know if you've ever used Pandora, but it's an Internet radio service. And you can plug in the kind of song you like, and it'll play songs like that song. Okay? So I set up a channel called the Petra Channel. And I plug in all these Petra songs. And it started playing songs. And songs it thought were like Petra. And it started playing songs by this guy. What's the guy's name? Jeremy Camp. Now, you may be a Jeremy Camp fan, bless your darling heart. But I have yet to hear a song of his that was not, woe is me, we're all tired and sore and, you know, we're climbing up the wrong side of the mountain, except it's modern. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, what, what? That's not Petra. That doesn't have anything to do with it. But see, to Pandora, it's a contemporary Christian song, so I'm going to play it. So I go, no, I don't like that one. Next one, Jeremy Camp. No, I don't like that one. Next one, Jeremy Camp. No, I, well, see, he's popular, so they're playing all these songs, but it's knucklehead that don't know nothing about the Word of God. Oh, I shouldn't have, well, yeah, I should have said that, because it's truth. But, you know, I should have used his name. I should have said a, a contemporary Christian artist. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, so I think that Pandora should have an option for scriptural accuracy. And you should be able to hit a button that says, it's got to be scriptural. Now I'm sure their computer would go, what? <laughs> it can't understand that. But at least don't be a downer. I mean, bless their hearts. And it just seems like all of the contemporary music scene these days has gone that way. So... Back to the 80s for me. Hallelujah. Anyway, you know, I cannot be defeated, and I will not quit. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I've been loose from Satan's pit. Kenneth Copeland's song. Anyway, that's what I do here. And see, if I'm hearing that, I'm shaping my soulish realm. See, that's what it talks about when it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
It's talking about renewing your soulish realm to the Word of God. And if we're listening to all this junk, thinking it's contemporary Christian music, it's programming our mind that woe is us, I'm tired, defeated, I'll never make it. We don't need to hear that. We need to program ourselves with the Word of God, which means you've got to hear scriptural songs that are Word of God songs. Okay, I'll get off the soapbox now. Let's go back to, go back to Scripture. Uh, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now we said a while ago we wanted to get into the deep things. Well, there you go. For, here we go, what man knoweth the things of a man, save or except the spirit of a man which is in him? Now, for instance, Blinda and I are married, have been married for a very long time, but she is a unique individual with her own spirit. I am a unique individual with my own spirit. Now, we are joined together and are one, but we don't have the same mind. We don't have the same human spirit. I can a lot of times know what she's thinking, and a lot of times we even finish each other's sentences. But still in all, she thinks things that I don't think. I think things that I don't think. Who can know what is going on in her spirit? Her own spirit, right? Well, here the Lord says... What man knows the things of a man, in other words, how can I know what Belinda's thinking, unless I am her spirit within her, save or accept the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God, the thoughts, the intents, the purposes of God, knows no man because it's his spirit. It sits within him, right? He's an individual. He is a spirit. God is a spirit. That's what the scripture says. So he knows what he's thinking. The only thing that can know what he's thinking is his spirit. But see, this is what's really cool. We have his spirit. Now think about this. If it were possible for Belinda's spirit to be placed in me, I could know everything she's thinking because I would have her spirit. Now, I can't know everything she's thinking because I don't have her spirit within me. That's why mental telepathy cannot be scriptural or correct. Because in effect you're saying I can know what you're thinking. The only way I can know what you're thinking is to have your spirit within me or to have a spirit give me the information, which is the mental telepathy part. That's devil's. You see what I'm saying? So mental telepathy, well, you know, Dr. Bill, it's possible that mental telepathy is a function of the mind and the power of the mind that we don't fully understand yet. No, it's devils. It's devils. The only way I can know your mind is to, for a spiritual transfer of information. That's what the Bible just said. But the difference is, this is the one unique situation where I can have the spirit of an individual in me the Holy Spirit of God, therefore I can know the things of God. I can know what he's thinking. How? Now, here's the other thing. If I knew the things that were Belinda was thinking, that would be an advantage to me. As her husband, yes. I think you know where I'm headed with that. But at the same time, as cool as that would be and as beneficial as that would be, the ability to know what God's thinking is a whole lot better and a whole lot more useful. And if we would tap into this, we would have a tremendous benefit in our lives. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians are completely oblivious to this truth. They're not thinking, wow, I have God's mind at my disposal. See, I just got a, a little glimpse of this revelation when I was studying computers back in the early 80s when I was in school. 
And I, I just told you a little while ago my math coprocessor is not that sharp. And math has never been a strong suit of mine. And when I was in high school, I hate to admit this, but I mean, I made A's and B's. Except in math, I failed algebra. I'm talking about an E for the entire year. Okay? Or F, whatever it is. Depends on your scale. And I was so upset because I was on college prep and I had to have algebra. So I had to take it over. So I said, oh, please don't give me Ms. Yoakley. Please don't give me Ms. Yoakley. Because that's who I'd had and it was a terrible experience. So I go into class first day. It's Ms. Yoakley. Same teacher, same class, same old dry. Turn to page 43. So I went to her after the first day of class. And I said, Ms. Yoakley, I've got to pass this class. She said, you're a smart boy. He'll just listen every day. I'm doomed. <laughs> so I went through the whole class. At the end of the class, I had a 69. 70 was passing. I had a 69. I was going to fail again. And she told me, she said, Bill, bless your heart. I'm going to give you the extra point. So I got out of there with a D minus. So, math, algebra particularly, was not my strong suit. Well, let me tell you about computers. Computers are based on math. They're based on algebraic expressions. They're based on logic, if then else. So, in the 80s, when I was deciding, boy, I really want to get into computers, I had a mental block because I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. You see what I'm saying? So I had heard Brother Hagin talk about the life of God. He said, I tapped into the life of God, and I began to study, and I said, I, I will have supernatural recall of everything I need to remember. And he said, I made straight A's in school. Well, he got a hold of it when he was 16. I got a hold of it much later. I was in my 20s. I'd already gone through college. I was out of college, and now I was going back to school for computers. And I'm sitting there going hexadecimal, binary, logic, if, then, else, or. But I said, Bless God, I got the life of God in me. Bless God, I'm going to know this. I'm going to study this. I'm going to stay with this. I made straight A's. I'm talking miracle. The Red Sea parting. I mean, literally. And I would study and study and study, and I would play it over and over in my head, and I made A's in all of my computer courses. Summa cum laude. Hallelujah. And it was all God, because it wasn't me. But then it's like everything clicked. Everything came to me. It just all, the whole computer world just came together because I relied on his ability, not my ability. And, of course, now, what's 30 plus years in the, using computers, it's all second nature now. It's like, well, of course I know this. Everybody knows this. Well, no, not everybody does, but praise the Lord. It worked for me because I relied on something beyond myself. Same thing with our lives and our destiny. God's got a plan, but guess what? People say, well, if I knew what it was, I'd be doing it. Well, then you're not tapping in. We have the mind of Christ. Past tense, we have. Have? That means I possess it. See, I have this phone. It's mine. It belongs to me. All right? I don't have to hope to have a phone. I have a phone. Okay? I don't hope to have the mind of Christ. I've got the mind of Christ. I have access to the deep things of God. So don't think I can't know my destiny. You can know your destiny because you've got ta you're tapped in. You're hooked up, dude, to the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. All right, let's keep reading here. Who can know these things but the Spirit of God? Verse 12. Now, now. We have received, have received, in past tense, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Why have we received the spirit which is of God? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Wow. That we might know, not that we might guess. 
Not that we might hope, but that we might know the things of God because he's freely given them to us. He's not holding out. The wisdom is hidden, but it's hidden for us, not from us. That's a very important distinction. Your destiny, your direction in life is not hidden from you. It's hidden, so the devil doesn't know what's going on, but it's hidden for you. But it is hidden, which means you have to tap into it. It's not just going to come up to you like ripe apples off a tree. You're going to have to apply yourself to know these things. You're going to have to apply yourself to hook into what you already have access to. It's like the old illustration, good illustration, of a guy who somebody deposits a million dollars in his bank account, and he comes and tells you, you now have a million dollars in your bank account. And you go, I don't believe that. I don't believe he put a million dollars in my bank account. You can have the checkbook in your hand. If you don't write the checks, you don't get the benefit. But you know the entire time you had a million dollars in your bank account, you just never wrote a check on it. And you're, you're, you're scrimping and pinching pennies and trying to do the best you can, and you've got a million dollars in your account. Write the check. Amen? Well, the same thing. We have access into the deep things of God. God has freely given us knowledge. He's freely given us. He's breathed puffs <laughs> of inspiration into us. But we're not writing the checks. We're not tapping in. We're not making decisions to listen and pay attention to what God wants to do in our lives. All right. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these great and precious promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, we have partaken of God's divine nature. We have the Spirit of God within us. We have access into His divine nature. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to go through some of these fairly quickly. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit, God's spirit, of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself, and I realize King James says itself, but it's him. He is a he. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together with him. In other words, we have in our human spirit the Holy Spirit, and he is bearing witness to us. He's sharing this information with us. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1. This is the, the last scripture that I want to cover, but I want to give you a little example of what I'm talking about after I give you this scripture. 1 Peter 1, 5 in the King James says, who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. But I like what the Message Bible says. Listen to the Message Bible. Same verse. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all. Life healed and whole. Check that first part out. God is keeping careful watch over us and our future. God has a future. He has a destiny. He has a plan for us. Now, let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about and how I believe you can tap into this. You've probably heard me tell you before many years ago, August of 1980, I was pastoring at the time and I was about to get up and preach that uh, Sunday evening at church and I was sitting on the front row and my associate pastor was up making announcements and he was about to introduce me, and, and I was sitting there. And I could see it clear as right today as it was happening right now. I was sitting there, and the Lord spoke to me. And I didn't hear an audible voice, you know. If you were sitting there with me, you wouldn't have heard it. But down in my spirit, I heard, you will proclaim the word of faith, be a showcase of ministries, and train people to fulfill the word of God. And I went, wow. Well, I wrote that down, and I dated it, and I, you know, signed it, and I had my little notebook there. And then I got up and preached it. 
I hadn't even studied any scriptures. So I'm just going through going, well, you know, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> but I preached it that night, but then I started meditating on it. I'll proclaim the word of faith. I'll be a showcase of ministry. Lord, what's a showcase? Well, a showcase is a display case where you display your finest things. Okay. All right, showcase. Ministries. So not just my ministry, but other people's ministries. Well, that's the health ministry. Lord, I'm going to help people get their ministry out there where people can hear it. Okay, all right. So I begin to meditate on this. See, he revealed a word. You know the difference between a word and a novel? Word short. <laughs> There's only one of those. It's a word. But the whole novel is made up of a whole bunch of words. So he'd given me a word, and I had to meditate on it to get the novel. Okay? I had to get the rest of the information I needed. And so as the years went by, now 1980 to now is a bunch of years. Somebody help. 42 years? 32 years. Thank you. See, I told you math was not my strong suit. 32 years. Hallelujah. So 32 years ago in August, the Lord told me that. And I've been thinking about it ever since. I've been meditating on it ever since. I've been turning it over in my mind. What does that mean, Lord? Proclaim the word of faith. Okay, I'm pretty much clear on that. i got to teach the word of faith. Not the word of doubt and unbelief. The word of faith. Which Paul said he preached. I'm in good company. Yeah. Okay. So the word of faith. All right, I got that. We'll, we'll go with the word of faith. Not the word of anything else. Not whatever the latest fad is. But the word of faith. Word of faith is what I'm going to preach. You know what? My ministry is called Word of Faith Ministry. I wonder why. <laughs> so... Word of Faith Ministries Incorporated. I formed it in 1980, right after this happened. And, and I did all the legal work and everything. And it's because I teach the Word of Faith. Now, showcase of ministry. That took a little more understanding. I began to understand that what I needed to do was help other ministries. So I started teaching them how to do a radio program. I started teaching them how to do publications. I started putting together, how do you do this? How do you do that? And this, I'm talking back in the 80s. You know, there was no internet. That like we know it. Now, the Internet's been around since the 60s, but there was no World Wide Web. It wasn't public. People weren't using it the way they are today. So I used the technologies I had at hand to do. Well, I've always been interested in technology. So that just tied right into the showcasing ministries. And then the web did come along in 1992, and I got involved in that and started doing websites. Well, then I started doing websites for folks. Showcasing ministries. See? Then train people to fulfill the Word of God. Well, that's the teaching ministry. So I began to train people. I got involved with Life Christian University. I got my doctorate, and I started teaching, and I started doing all these different things, and writing uh, articles, and putting it on the web, and doing all these things. Training people to fulfill the Word of God. Then I started doing video. 2005 or so. Got involved in video. Started doing video. And all of that happened toward a direction, toward a purpose, toward a destiny. And then recently, I was sitting right back there, and the Lord said something to me in the middle of prayer one Sunday night. You know we've been having prayer on Sunday nights. If we turn the lights down, we get it all nice and quiet, and everybody's praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm back there praying, and the Lord said something to me again, kind of like what he did <laughs> that one Sunday night. He said, it's time for a Word of Faith Roku channel. And I thought, well, praise God, that sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, I can turn the Roku channel on now and, and see doubt and unbelief. I mean, word of faith. I said, Lord, I'm with it. I'm for you. I, word of faith, Roku channel. That sounds great. But I immediately thought, now check this. I immediately thought, oh, I don't have the money. Yeah, it'd take a lot of money to develop a Roku channel. And I don't know how to do it. And I'd have to hire somebody to do it. I don't have money, you know. Well. So then I thought, wait a minute, then i got to get creative. So here's what I'll do. I know Brother Hagen, Pastor Hagen, he can do it. He's got the money. And what I need to do is I, need, I know that he's coming to Pastor's house, and Pastor's going to have him there and have supper. So what I'll do is I'll get a Roku in Pastor's house, and I'll get it set up, and I'll say, now, Pastor, the only thing I ask is that you show Brother Hagen so he can create a Roku channel. And so... He said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. So Brother Hagin came to Pastor's house, had supper with him. He demoed the Roku channel, and within two months, 
Brother Hagin had a Roku channel. And I went, hallelujah, glory to God. Oh, Lord, thank you for using me, Lord. Well, see, that was my prayer. You know, I figured <laughs> I did what I could do. I was there. I said, here you go. And, and I felt good about it. I really did. I felt like, wow, this is great. Well, then Brother Copeland got a Roku channel. I'm like, oh, man, this, I'm in the flow now. Hallelujah. But it still kept going around him. We need a word of faith for the channel. I said, well, now, Lord, we got a, Brother Hagen's got one. Brother Copeland's got one. We got word of faith Roku channel now. He said, we need a word of faith Roku channel. And it finally clicked in my mind. Word of faith meaning word of faith ministries, meaning our ministry needs a Roku channel. But, Lord, I don't have the money. I don't have the knowledge to program one. So I went to a class in Atlanta, Georgia. Make a long story short, I'm sitting in class, and they had a break in the class. And it was a class on a technical thing that I had. I went to Atlanta for. But I'm sitting there going, and I'm surfing. That's what you do on break, you know. So I'm surfing, and I said, "What does it take to develop a Roku channel?" I plugged that into Google, and I went through, and I'm looking at websites, and this one website jumped out at me. And a part of the website, this guy said, "If you would like to develop a Roku channel, I can probably help you. Just send me an email." Well. You know, you don't know unless you do the research, so I'll find out what it costs. So I sent him an email. This is what I want to do. He sends me an email back says, I think I can do it for you this weekend. Now I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is Wednesday. I'm in class in Atlanta. He says he can get it done by this weekend. I'm like, you know, this is interesting. I'm thinking this is a divine appointment. So he sends back and says, not only can I do it this weekend, but... Uh, I've looked at your website and your ministry, and I'm just going to do it for you for free. So I went, hallelujah. So he writes the code, puts it all together, does a, a demo channel, and says, what do you think? And I'm like, wow. And he said, oh, by the way, here's the instructions on how to develop it, and here's the instructions on how to tweak it, and he gave me all the knowledge and information I need to do it myself. So then I could tweak it and design it and change it, and I got it working, and it was a beta channel where... Nobody could tap into it unless they knew it was there. And that's fine, but you don't get a whole lot of viewers if, if it's secret, you know what I'm saying? So after I developed it, I said, all right, how do I submit it? So I did some research, and I found out how to submit it to be a permanent, official, sanctioned channel that's in their channel store. And I wrote them. I heard nothing. That was March, April. May, June. So I, I sent an email, nice, sweet email to him. Hi there. I submitted my channel. I haven't heard anything. Could you maybe let me know what I'm lacking? No. So I sent another email. Hi there. Sweet, kind. Is there anything I can do to expedite this? Finally, I get an email back. Uh, sorry, we've been busy. Uh, tell you what. You need to do this, this, and you got this this week. And I said, oh, okay. So I dig into that. And he says, you got this problem. I fixed that. And I resubmitted it. Another month goes by. Now it's G uh, July. And suddenly, I get an email. By the way, it's been approved, and it's now in the channel store. I went, wow. So I was sitting in the living room, and I went, wow! And Melinda went, what? <laughs> And I said, they approved the channel. So I went to the channel store, and there it was, speakfaith.tv, right there. And I was like, wow. So then I thought, wow, it's, it's been introduced to the channel store. I wonder how long it will take before people start connecting. Wow. First day, we had 200 people connect. Now, when I say 200 people, we're talking households. They connect, and the whole family gets to see it. 200 the first day. 400 the second day. We're now up to almost 900 households. And they haven't even advertised yet. Last night I got another email that says, we have entered you into our uh, search system, and here's your write-up. If you'd like to tweak it or change it, change it, let us know. So I sent back and said, yeah, if you can tweak this and fix that. So now it's going into their advertising base, and the more people connect, the more advertising they'll do. And the more people connect, the more people we reach. So now all of our messages here and all of our videos 
And all the videos we do through Word of Faith Ministries are going into over 800 homes around the world. And I thought about all that and I thought, wow, this is great. And that's when the Lord told me, that's because it's destined. That's because I'm directing you. Who told you to start the channel? He did. I was sitting right back there. I, didn't, I had no idea. I mean, it wasn't a matter of did I have desire. I didn't even think about it. Until he said, we need a Word of Faith Roku channel. And I went, but I can't. See, that was me. That was the that was the mind saying, you don't have the resources. Well, God is God. He's got resources. He can do divine connection. Not even any money changed hands. People say, I can't do anything for God. I don't have the finances. You don't need finances. You need God. So see, what I'm saying is, you say, well, wow, Brother Bill, that's great. He did that for you. Well, he'll do it for you too. He's no respecter of person. The difference is, Pray. Seek God. Find out what you are to do, what your destiny is. Or, Dr. Bell, I don't have a destiny. Yes, you do. It may not have anything to do with video. It may not have anything to do with Roku. It may not have anything to do with preaching the gospel even. Maybe it's that he wants you to be a billion trillionaire and finance the gospel, so he's going to give you some amazing invention that you're going to invent and patent and put out there and have a thousand people working for you in some big corporation. I have no idea. It's your destiny, not mine. But you need to tap into it because once you tap into it, that's where the excitement is. You talk about fun. You talk about getting excited. You, you ask Belinda and Ben, man, I sat there. When I, the night that it was officially approved, I stayed up till 2.30 that morning Sending out emails and writing letters and, you know, promoting and, and social networking and, you know, I mean, I'm just promoting it. And I'm staying up till 2.30 in the morning. I was so excited. I couldn't sleep because I was so thrilled. At you say, well, what do you do? That's not my, I, I'm not excited about that. Fine, that's because it's not your destiny. Right. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm excited because I'm tapping into what God's got for me to do. But see, he's also got something for you to do. And most likely, since you're a member of Faith and Victory Church, it's through Faith and Victory. It's something you need to be doing here. It may be something you need to be doing in your own personal life or your own job or, or whatever. You know, God has given you an open an opportunity and you jumped on that and now it's developing and you're looking like, wow, this is more than I can ask or think. That's the thought that it occurred to me when it came to this channel. I thought, this is more than I can ask or think. I would have never even thought about developing a channel like this. And now it's really opening up because Brother Harold with Word of Faith Radio said, oh, by the way, I was talking to Jerry Savelle Ministries and, and they won't know if they can go and speak faith about some And I went, sure. Yeah. And then he said, I can get you in touch with other ministries that we have on Word of Faith Radio that have video programs. And I'm like, a word of faith? Roku channel. <laughs> it doesn't have to be just Faith and Victory Church or Word of Faith Ministries. It could be Jerusalem or it could be all these other people that don't have their own channel, don't have their own people that are technical, that understand how to put that together, but can just say, here you go, put it out there. And then we can put all that word out there on one channel that people can connect to. And being speakfaith.tv, it's not tied specifically. It's just speak faith. It's the word. So praise the Lord. So I'm seeing a future. I'm seeing great things, a whole, you know, developed system of video teaching throughout the world. And see, that's the other thing. God gave me insight, knowledge, and ability to be able to make this the highest level technically. I'm using technologies like Amazon's S3 and stuff that huge major corporations are using. But he's given me access to it and the ability to, to put it out there. And we have a second-to-none infrastructure for this channel. And I'm like, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for using me to do this. It's so humble. It has nothing to do with me personally. It has everything to do with tapping into the destiny. Which is why I want you to tap into the destiny he has for you. Because you ought to be having as much fun as I have. Do you do that? 
I am just, I mean, it's fun. It's fun, fun, fun. And I'm getting to play with stuff and technology and things that just, just turned my motor into overdrive. So that's me. You have something that's just as exciting. So pray. Have faith in the fact that God's given you the deep things of God, giving you insight. Be open to receive. And you will be amazed at what he has for you. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had this morning to come receive instruction. And really, Lord, just remind us. That's, that's what this has been, is a reminder of what we have available to us and that we can tap into these things and we have a destiny. Father, we thank you that you care enough so much for us that you've given us a future. You've given us a destiny. You've given us a direction that is exciting and interesting and fascinating to be involved in. And Father, we're excited about that. We're just we're open to tap into it. So, Father, give us instruction, give us direction, not only for us personally, but for the church. And, of course, speaking to Pastor Ed about that, all of what you have for us to do, we just want to be right in the middle of the flow of what you have for us to do. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.